So the survey was conducted, um, again, to sort of help us continue our work around identifying the progress that we're making towards our mission and vision and to make sure that we're collecting stakeholder input on some of the work that we're doing. The survey was done this year in January, um, mid to late January, because we were also doing the NEAS survey at the high school during our fall window, so we held off and conducted the survey during the winter window. And we got the results on March 27th, um, and so those results were reviewed by um, leadership uh, in April and May. Some guidelines around how the scores were interpreted and um, over at my seat are about 700 pages worth of data that comes out of this survey and, and that, that doesn't include the comments, which are another 100 or so pages of, of information. So there's a lot to digest, so we're really only hitting the high points. And um, I'm hitting sort of district level high points and then building administrators are, are working in their buildings and with their faculty and through their own analysis to look at what some of the specific pieces are um, for them. So strengths are, you know, if you had more than a 75% favorable rating, they're considered real strengths. And this survey comes from the National Center for School Leadership. And so it's a national survey that includes hundreds of thousands of students and parents and faculty members, so it's a um, well-vetted survey. If our results are at least 10% above the national average, it's considered a very positive strength, and they consider opportunities, places where we have a 20% or more unfavorable rating um, from our constituents, things you want to work on, and if we're 10% or more below the national, national average, a better shine a spotlight on that and figure out what exactly is going on. The <laughs> Student Engagement and Satisfaction Survey, which I'll speak to first, looks at the items listed up there, school climate, relationships, voice choice, feedback, goal setting, student engagement, and um, flexible teaching styles. Again, things that very much resonate with our mission and vision and values, which is part of the reason we chose this survey initially. And so some significant strengths that we saw um, relative to the national averages, 86% of our kids say they're satisfied with the overall quality of their school. 83% say they're treated fairly by adults at school. 62% say teachers provide me with specific input on how I'm performing in school. 59% say teachers listen and respond when I have something to say. 76%, sorry about that. And 60% say my teachers readily listen to and accept student ideas and suggestions about classwork. Again, those are all significantly above the national averages. Some other very positive strengths. I feel safe at school, um, which I think is something we all value and want to hear from our kids. Um, but again, con contrasted with the national average, 90% of our kids are saying they feel safe at school. 89% uh, say their parents are well informed about academic progress, and that lines up pretty well with what you see on the parent survey a little bit later. 89% say they feel encouraged to do well in school. 88% say they understand the academic expectations that the school has for them. And 86% say my teachers help me with schoolwork when I need it. So again, um, uh, more information that students are feeling sort of supported um, in the school environment. Some weaknesses. This one, maybe not one that we're uh, <laughs> terribly concerned about this year, um, but I know how I've performed on the most recent standardized tests. Was this asked before or after? Uh, before. Okay. before so it would have referred to last year's and again if if you're a high school student you haven't tested every year um, and so again the survey was administered to students in grades 5 through 12 and may or may not be particularly um, informative for them oh I'm provided with useful information about careers colleges and other opportunities again we're, we're sort of in line with the national average but but it is a, one of our more lower ranked numbers and again when you think about this is sort of grades 5 through 12 Students in middle school are likely, oh, and as you look at the data, are reporting that a little bit less than their older peers. My school provides students with many options in terms of classes to take, 16% uh, uh, unfavorable. 
So, that's a little hard to read. You, if you need to borrow my glasses, let me know. But, so here are areas for improvement. Um, and these are, again, the, the percentages that are identified here are the unfavorable percentages. So this is why they're identified as areas for improvement. Again, a number of students are saying either neutral or more positive things. But if you have more than 20% re responding unfavorably, the, suggest the way that this data is recommended for interpretation by the National Center for School Leadership is this is a concern, something that you should look at. David, I saw your hand. I, I was, I'm a little confused. Maybe it's just because these metrics are a little bit hard for me to grasp. I keep trying to add them to get to 100. But it, it, it's, so what were the rankings? Favorable, OK, unfavorable? So there's a, f a five point scale ranging from like highly, yes, this is absolutely great, to no, this is terrible as a one. And so favorable ratings are fours and fives, neutral ratings are threes, and unfavorable ratings are ones and twos. So is it technically possible to have on a particular question, you have 20, 15% say unfavorable, but 75% say wonderful. Yes. So we're, the selection of being unfavorable is 10, 15, 20% say unfavorable. Right. Could so, this reflect that the people have tremendously diverse opinions on something? Absolutely, but I think it's also useful to look at the national averages, which is why I've included those here. So if you look at the first bullet there, my school provides students with many options in terms of classes to take. 22% of our students said they didn't feel that that was the case, meaning they gave a one and a two. But only 15% of students nationally said that. So again, yes, there are many layers of that. But the suggestion to us is we should be taking a look at that and identifying, is this something that, that needs attention? And you, know, you just heard Jeff report on one of the ways the high school is addressing choice for students by giving them the opportunity to propose um, credit earning opportunities that, that connect to their passions and interests. Our extended learning opportunity coordinator position is another way that, that we're working towards addressing that particular issue. Okay. One of the metrics that is incorporated in our strategic plan indicators of success is the next one. I'm very interested in my schoolwork. 22% of our students responded unfavorably to that, so meaning about one in five kids is saying, no, not really, um, as compared to 28% of students nationally. So they were a little above the national. Um, the national is closer to one in three. <laughs> um, Third bullet, my schoolwork requires me to think, and this is another one included in our indicators of success, about how various topics relate to real life situations. Again, about one in five of our students saying not so much. Next bullet, my schoolwork often consists of using hands-on examples as part of the learning process. Again, about one in four of our students, 27% saying that isn't their experience. My teachers align their lessons to match my personal learning style. Again, one in 35% or a little bit more than one in three of our students don't feel that that's the case. 26% um, of our students say my teachers responded unfavorably to the question, my teachers seem to understand how I learn best. And 21% uh, of our students responded unfavorably to the prompt, the teachers in my school do a good job of making the material interesting to me. So again, these are things for us to look at, explore, think about. You read them with the comments. You look at them in terms of sort of conversation and dialogue. And, and, and so that the overwhelming responses to the survey are highly favorable. But these are particular areas, many of which align with some of the things we've identified in our indicators of success as wanting to look at and make progress with. Student voice and choice, student engagement, student motivation, student, students finding the work that they do in school more relevant to um, their futures. Some concerns um, that we identified in, in going through this work, 48% of our students, um, so less than half, are saying bullying is not a problem at their school. So meaning 52% of students are saying that bullying is, or perceive that bullying is a problem. Um, and that number is lower than our number last year. So 2014, 58% of our students said that bullying was a problem. <laughs> Again, that's an area we're paying a lot of attention to with our work with um, Steve Wessler and our climate and culture work uh, across the district, the civil rights team at the middle school. 71% of our students report that they have at least one teacher or counselor who knows them well. This is the insert there as a person. 
Um, again, that's data was also included in our, that particular prompt is also part of one of the measures of our indicators of success. We also use our um, main integrated youth health survey response to that particular question. Last year, the average was 76%, this year it's 71. It's within it, the margin of error. It's within the margin of error, absolutely. And that's, that's true for, for most of these. You'll see that on the next one as well. Um, and 46% of our students, so again, less than half, um, report that schoolwork requires them to think about how <coughs> topics relate to real life situations. So again, areas that, as we think about our progress moving forward and our growth as a district, things we want to continue to attend to. <coughs> we switch gears to look at the parent engagement and satisfaction <coughs> survey. So it's, again, looking at the things you see listed there, academics, communication, discipline, homework, progress monitoring, engagement, satisfaction, responsiveness, and climate and pride in schools. So our very positive strength, and again, this is where I suggested that it aligns well with what we hear from our students, but parents are regularly checking information and are very involved. 95% of them report that they attend most school events offered to parents, including parent-teacher conferences and open houses. And any of you who have tried to park anywhere near the schools on nights when those events are occurring know full well that that is a pretty representative number. Uh, my child's school is well regarded in the community. Again, 89% of our parents feel that that's the case. And a relative strength, 5% above the national average, my child's school is superior to other schools in the area. So about two thirds of our parents, 64%, report that they find that to be true. Areas for improvement, and these were the only two areas in our parent survey that had uh, ratings of 20% or more uh, parents responding unfavorably. The school does a great job of challenging my child to his or her fullest potential. Um, again, about a quarter of our parents feel that that's not the case. And again, that relates to our work around differentiation, our, our work to strengthen and develop this year, our, our GT piece to make sure that we're serving students who need that work, our summer school work, all of those pieces. Um, and then the next area, um, and I think I refer to this later on as well, but oftentimes uh, my child's homework assignment requires interaction with me or others in our family. Not, not necessarily something that every assignment is going to require, but part, part of sometimes what we're looking for, what, what I think many of us as educators look for in a homework assignment is, is it something the child can do on his or her own? Do they have the requisite skills to be able to do this independent practice that, that essentially is the homework assignment? So I'm confused. Are they saying that being able to do it independently is a favorable or unfavorable? So no, so what this question really is trying to get at is that is, is there a level of interaction? Does, does my child interact with me around homework? Do I need to get involved here? And, and use that as a positive? Okay. I guess it would also depend on the age of the student. Again, these are fifth through twelfth grade okay. parents responding. Well, actually, parents responding are all grades. Students who responded are five through twelve. Um, Concerns, again, as we look at our mission, vision, and values and some of the goals that we've identified, 57% of parents report that the school does a good job of meeting the needs of all of its students. So again, within the margin of error of last year, last year was a 55%, but um, not quite two thirds of our parents, a little more than half. 47% uh, of our parents, and again, this is pretty consistent with the student number, report that their child's school does an excellent job dealing with student bullying. 51% of parents report that the school offers them or her opportunities to explore areas of interest outside the core content areas. Again, that's one that also aligns pretty closely with the student results. And 51% of parents report that the school does a great job of challenging my child to his or her full potential. Hmm. <laughs> so in summary, our district results, and again, this is a highlight and the full um, 380 pages of each survey is available online as a PDF, but district results are overall really favorable and, and pretty consistent with the national data. Um, you see that our students feel safe, they feel supported, they feel encouraged, which I think is, is what you need as a foundation in order to grow. Um, we did hear from them, again, that they're looking for increased choice, um, some more relevance and personalization. 
Parents are active and involved and take great pride in their child's school, which I think you all can take pride in as well. And again, the pieces where, where we see concerns from them are around sort of increased choice and challenge. That's it in a nutshell. I'm happy to answer any questions. Will you, will you tell me again, uh, tell us again about how you use this data um, to make changes in, how do you work, first you work with administrators, um, what's, how do, you, how do you break it down? So, so I sent the data to administrators, they get the full results including the comment pieces, um, and it's, it's essentially sort of, we reported to you a little bit about the pieces that specifically tied to our indicators of success at our workshop last month. But it, it's using that information to sort of share, and I'm sure any of them can speak to that, but it's sharing with their staff. Okay, what do we see? You know, sitting down and saying, what do we see as concerns here? What do we see as highlights? What themes do we notice? It's, it's, a, it's a data walk, essentially, through here's the information. What does it tell us about our work with students? Where do we see concerns? And um, again, each building's data is a little bit different, and the themes that they're, they're going to glean from that are a little bit different than what we might see as the district level. But as the district level, these are pieces that sort of rise to the surface. Last year, for example, we talked about how um, at the middle school, there was a particular concern about um, choice, right? <coughs> And so, so that was a particular theme that stood out most at the middle school as we looked at the data last year. Um, at, at the high school, I think the um, connection to adults was a, a piece that was focused on, which was part of the impetus for the advisory work. So, so it's, it's, it's informing the work that we do with, with students moving forward and, and with parents. And again, I think what we see is overall, parents are generally pretty satisfied with the communication that they're getting for the, from the district, that they have access to information, that they feel that they're informed, they know how to see how their students are doing academically, um, that you know, they get newsletters and communication, and you know, there are several of those 380 pages that, that talk about those kinds of pieces. Um, but they also say, hey, I'm not so sure my child's challenged. And we're a community with very high expectations, we know that. And so the value of having the national data is that it, it, it helps us really sort of look at that through a, through a more normative lens. Um, as, you know, aside from the you know, people joke about the Lake Wobegon and everybody here is above average, but I, you know, we do have a lot of students here who perform above average. And, and so I, our expectations as a result increase, but not every student is performing above average. And so we have to honor every child as a part of that process. But uh, so to give you the examples, I think the most concrete examples are, uh, that I can give you are how the data informed some of the work that took, took place this year, informing the advisory system, informing the work with Steve Wessler around civil rights, informing um, the work that we're doing around voice and choice and, and the, um, pieces just described for the extended learning opportunity pieces for kids. That's great. Um, are there any more questions for Barbara and then John? Um, two things I, would, I wanted to know. I, I went through all of this at home sure. in, in detail. I thought it was really interesting. I, I like how you sort of flipped the unfavorable instead of celebrating always the 80% said yes, there are 20% saying mm, maybe not so much and yeah. those are definitely worth looking at. Um, I had misread, you know, I think to David's question about what does that represent when you're showing the unfavorables and it is a reminder that despite 80-85% approvals there still is mm -hmm. a, a handful of students who, who have some needs that, you know, we're looking to meet. The, the second observation though I met is even though most things look pretty grand, and maybe Mike has a comment to make about this too, but, and maybe it's told in the, in the comments area, but there was, it was noticeably stronger um, robust responses, elementary, high school with a dip in the middle. Yep. And I wondered if it's because of some of the work that's happening right now, Michael, that's making things feel a little more um, uh, not 
not as, as uh, carefully organized as maybe they've been in the past, or, or is, it, is it just because of the age of the kids? But both the kids and the parents had a little lower positive responses on, on many questions. And um, if you look at the summary that the middle school provided last year, you see that that's pretty consistent nationally. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it doesn't stand out when you look at the data yeah. nationally. It, it's right. as you sort of hit that adolescent right. dip and students right. are you know, beginning to develop some of their independence and autonomy and, and sort of push back at mm -hmm. some of the norms and rules and distance themselves and separate a bit from parents. It, it, that's right. a pretty consistent picture of what we see nationally. So again, we highlighted things, you know, last year that were of particular concern at the mm -hmm. middle school. And I know Mike mm -hmm. has, has been working with his faculty around some of the themes this year, but it, it doesn't stand out when you look across right. the picture. Right. Right, exactly. Yeah, the parents and kids had sort of a, a, a common flattening there, and I know that provokes conversation for you all, and I appreciate that, but I'd love to, you know, when, you, when you've had a chance to really drill in to let us know some of the themes that you guys have seen now a couple years in a row and what, what response there might be to it, I'd like to see from parents at least a consistent message across the district. I think that would be a good goal for us. So, John, did you? Sure. Uh, so I, I recall from last year's survey, I think, that there was that challenge piece where parents said that they didn't feel their child was necessarily challenged to its, his or her fullest potential was, was contrasted a bit by a, 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 some high levels of student-reported stress. And I can't remember what I'm recalling that that stress piece from this specific survey from last year or whether that information was f from other reports of student stress. But mm -hmm. um, so was it from this? And, and did you do any analysis of how, I know two years isn't a lot of not a data to you know, assess trends, but was there, was there anything unfavorable that, that fell off this year or unfavorable last year that fell off this year or, or favorable this year that fell off that last year that fell off this year? I would say, well, first of all, the, this particular survey doesn't assess stress. The main integrated youth health survey gets at some of that. We, we, we as a district have, have been talking about the issue of student stress over the last three to four years as we worked on the mission, vision, and values because that was a large part of the information that we received both from students, well, from students, parents, and faculty when we did some of our original sort of stakeholder input sessions um, as we were developing the vision and mission. But I would say in response to your, the second part of that question, do we see, did we see particular things that sort of fell off this year that were stronger last year? Not, not yet. Um, there weren't significant differences in, uh, so yeah, something that maybe was a 10 point above percentage last year might have only been an eight or nine point percentage difference this year, but, but I wouldn't say fell off in, because it really isn't within that margin of error as Joe, Joe mentioned earlier. So they were still fairly consistent um, overall in the scores. And, and when I say fall off, I, I, mean, I don't mean to suggest that the problem, we would consider the problem solved um, if that's what it was, but... Um, I just wanted to make sure it was still on our, on our, in fact, the contrary, I wanted to make sure it was still on our, would still be on our mind. Absolutely. Okay. Um, I also looked at the middle school piece and I wondered about the fifth graders, there's a transition, they brought big transitions to me that I saw the fifth grade class definitely had lower scores and then the eighth grade class as well. And what I read as we've got young, kids coming from a very protective setting in Pod Cove, then going to middle school, and there's a shift there, and then eighth grade, big, you know, big kids on campus, um, parents have more anxiety, and they have more anxiety We're going to high school, and there's a, a shift, which brought me to our work with transitions, and I'm sorry, I didn't bring it up earlier as an agenda item, so I just wanted to state it, how are we doing on our transition work in our helping students and parents move through, you know, those big emotional changes, fourth grade to fifth grade, and then, of course, in uh, high school. I think there have been good efforts to strengthen it. Does that make it right. any less anxiety-provoking? Exactly. <laughs> 
Um, not entirely. Uh, I was chatting with Anamika sort of earlier, who was saying, well, I get my tour at the middle school tomorrow, and you know, her sister, who's a little bit younger, you know, when I said, oh, it'll be great to have your sister already know the middle school when you go, won't it? And she gave me a big smile and a nod, because that, it is a change. You know, this is where you've been for, for most of our kids, five years, and you're now making that, you know, that step up to where the older students are who have a different bus schedule, you're starting your day earlier, They're, you're going to have more than one teacher who you see for, for parts of your day. So there's a lot of change and, and the other piece that changes as we hear very often from parents is that the parents who've been, you know, chaperoning a lot of field trips or coming in and supporting at center time or literacy time or doing small group work with kids, that happens less right, in the middle school setting. And so parents are feeling a distancing at the same time that students are feeling a distancing. That said, I think the middle school has, has made great efforts to really try to bring parents in and help them feel welcome. There's a lot of conversation with the parents association about what that looks like. Mike has held sort of fourth grade, or not sort of, but has held fourth grade parent night. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> They really are fourth grade parent nights, so he has held those. Um, I, you know, the, Kelly and Mike have worked really closely around sort of thinking through what the transition look like, how do we do step up, when are the tours scheduled, good communication around sort of the academic transition, and, and with the support of Ruth Ellen, conversations of, between fourth and fifth grade teachers, which which hadn't happened consistently you know, over periods of time in this district through no one's fault, just the way that schedules work and things align and priorities shift um, has, has sort of come back into place. And so have we solved it all? No, it's great, but, but I think we're working. That's great. So my overall observations, um, the basis of what I do for work is depending on community surveys to measure our progress in order to implement a strategic plan that has happened in a community. And I review this year's and last year's survey not as a measure of our work or success, but as the baseline and then a verification of that baseline of the work that's yet to be put in front of us. Um, I, I personally look at some of the negativity responses of, of as you had very eloquently Posted areas of opportunity because there's no way that we can grow until we embrace what it is that we need to improve upon. And the fact that there's been consistent responses in the areas in which we've done really well and areas in where we're showing need to show improvement, I think that then that those align with the areas within our strategic plan to me verify that we got it right and we know where we need to go. And I think that we've done a lot of the heavy lifting by pointing our ships in the right direction. So I, I applaud the work that's been done with the building of the strategic plan before us and all those who've put hours and hundreds of hours into that plan, as well as the effort of the, the parents and the administrators and the teachers that have gone into helping implement that plan step by step. John, I mean, I'm sorry, David. No, I look like John, but he's Rick, older. Harry, you guys over there. Um, I, I have a little bit of concern with trying to judge our pluses or our minuses based on an opinion survey. To me, that's notoriously the weakest form of evidence you can think of. It depends on how educated people are, it depends on how they feel like when they fill it out. It depends on tons of stuff. I like the fact we're trying to analyze it not in terms... I guess I have a problem with saying, okay, we're great because it's 80%. Or I wonder, well, why do people 20% think it's not great? Or we have 20% people with a problem, well... Okay, but that, that might be a difficult area for a lot of people. I like the fact that we compare it to national to give us some strength of the relative, but I'm a little bit leery of national because national includes large inner cities, it includes poor areas, rich areas. It, it, I don't know if this survey data can be compared, for example, to... Yes. There's... <laughs> I'm answering your question because I know where it's going, but yes, you can compare it to small districts of That's roughly exactly our size I'm, that are I'm not in political. urban areas. And, yeah. and that breakdown is, is part of the data. There are many, many, many layers of data. And I, I, I'm trying to be succinct, but yes, you can look at it in terms of 
well, roughly comparable this For whatever it's worth, I think the, the most accurate way to look at opinion data is to compare it to a, a, an apple to an apple. Look at areas where people are high-performing districts with highly involved parents with, with all kinds of things. And if there is any validity to this, we should be, I think we should compare ourselves to like things. And it's nice that we have the data. I was wondering if we did. So are there any more questions on the survey? I'm, I'm just cognizant of time. It's 9.30 and we have quite the lengthy agenda in front of us. I don't want to shortchange the survey. Just a short, but just a short one. And, um, third strand being teacher engagement. Is that still coming? That wasn't part of this report. That's correct because it wasn't administered during the January survey. As uh, board will recall, the association had just administered a survey at right. that time and then we were sort of waiting to see if we were going to get full results of that and comments from that survey and did not. Um, so we had to wait till sort of the next window for the survey and then... Is that um, now or fall? It's now. Oh, it's now. Yep. Um, so we're, we're hoping to have the survey completed by the end of next week and hopefully most people will bear with us and, and um, fill that out. But um, it will be a couple of months typically before we get the results. Thank you. Thank you.